Okay, so we want to talk a little bit today about strategies for active learning in Micronus and HyFlex courses. And we thought we'd start with some definitions because a lot of people are using the term hybrid for in ways that was never meant. And we're seeing a lot of that on our campus too. The standard that most people in education seem to have stuck with is by Cronus for the type of experience that many of us have had since the start of the pandemic, where some students are in person and some students are remote. The reason we didn't see too much of it before the pandemic is because that was really rare. The traditional definition and the most commonly agreed definition of hybrid is some class meetings are in person, some class meetings or some class work is done outside of the class, um, but it's not a mix of the two. Uh, by Cronus is when you have some people attending in person and some people attending remotely, as has been true with all of our workshops. Uh, I think at each workshop, we've had some people in person and some people remote. And there are some challenges there that we want to talk about. And so that's by Cronus, where you're teaching a class in person, but some of the students are attending over Zoom or some other mechanism. And yeah, so um, the next definition is high flex, right? So um, there's been, I think, a lot of discussion and interest in high flex courses. And we can talk a bit about that too. But um, high flex, it takes a bichronos modality. So students who are participating synchronously in person or remotely um, synchronously. Um, and it's adding a fully asynchronous option for any given class meeting. So like John said, it's not that there are two you know, modalities that uh, students are all together switching from um, you know, within a class, but that they have the option to either attend in person remotely or complete the work asynchronously at any given class period. And this is a, that's the definition that SUNY has agreed on. A lot of people on our campus, including people who should know better, mm -hmm. conflate this with the type of instruction we're doing or referred to by Cronus as high flex. A true high flex class is one where students on any given day might attend in the classroom, might attend remotely over Zoom in a synchronous manner, or might do something entirely separate. And one of the issues there, and we'll talk about that more in just a couple of minutes, is that you have to plan essentially for an unknown number of students on any given day. You don't know whether the students will be in person, whether they'll be remote, or whether they won't be either, but doing a separate activity. And when you design a high flex course, essentially you're designing a fully online class a fully asynchronous online class on a daily basis, which is very different than the way in which most asynchronous courses take place and the way in which, and you're also designing a fully synchronous class and allowing for participation in either way, either directly in the room or remotely. And there's a lot of challenges with that. It's like designing two classes and in a lot of ways it's like running two classes and also in terms of planning, well, well, let's talk about, we've got some specific points. What we're going to focus on though, is not the asynchronous portion because there's a lot of workshops on teaching an online class. And that aspect of it is essentially like designing any other online class. This new type of thing, HyFlex has been around for a few years before the pandemic, but it certainly got a lot of attention during the pandemic. By Cronus, sometimes classes were recorded, sometimes they were live streamed, but generally remote students did not actively participate very much, except in exceptional uh, circumstances. For at least a decade, I've occasionally had students present over Zoom or over Google, um, well, uh, over Google, now, yeah, it's now called Google Meet. It was Google Hangouts back at the time when, yeah, um, or using some other system, but, it was a rare thing. And now for many of us, it's become the routine. For the last two semesters for me, I don't think I've, I've only had one class where everyone was attending in person in, in the classroom at the same time, where there was always between one and a couple dozen. Well, in some cases back in, if we go back a little further, sometimes 30 or 40 students who were attending remotely while the rest were in the classroom. So there's some challenges that come with this. And we want to talk about the challenges first before we talk about some possible solutions. 
Yeah, so John can probably speak a lot more to this because he's had a history of trying to get our our classrooms um, up to speed with some of the technology available. But um, you know, one of the big challenges is that most of our classrooms uh, don't have appropriate microphone arrays that will pick up all of the voices in the classroom. So the instructor, you know, can um, you know broadcast. You know, or they they can speak at the front of the room, and their voice is typically heard, you know, reasonably well um, over a remote session, a Zoom session. Um, but if a student is then commenting in the back of the class, um, you know, it's it's really on the professor to repeat that information so that the people who are attending remotely can hear that because there just isn't microphones set up in a way that picks up everybody's. Um, everybody's comments in the room. So that makes in-class discussions really difficult um, for the remote participants to follow online. Um, John, did you have your yeah, the, the basic issue is we have really crappy microphones, if we have any at all. Um, I thought we had them in all classrooms, but for the last three sem two semesters, the last two spring semesters, I was placed in rooms that didn't have any. Uh, and that's again to this semester and i'm kind of shocked that we are in that position uh, many colleges in fact many suny colleges uh spent a lot of money on upgrading the technology in rooms and that's something that i've been arguing for since march of 2020 i've been arguing it for years before that just to have the option but since march of 2020 i've been complaining about this just about constantly so i'll i'll stop the complaining but it's something that we really have underinvested in and it's 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 unfortunate because we have students who are out. We have students whose cars break down. We have students who are in quarantine. We have students who are away for family family emergencies. And you know, it wouldn't be a very expensive prospect to allow those students to participate wherever they were as long as they had an internet connection. And we can do it, but it's a, a bit challenging. Specifically, when I teach a large class, th there is a good microphone for the instructor. But if all you're doing is having lecture, you know, that could just be recorded and shared and the interaction wouldn't be terribly useful, uh, wouldn't be needed. But if we really want to have an interactive class with active learning, it's really important that students have microphones. That's challenging in a large class. Quite often, you may not want all the audio coming from the back of the room broadcast sure. to everyone participating remotely. But it is an issue. Um, and what I've done in my own classes when I'm teaching in small rooms is I bring my own microphones to the class. And I also bring a second screen and so forth, just so I can handle remote chat. But um, but I think most people probably are not doing that. And that's an area I'd like to see us invest more. Yeah, so, um, you know, again, if you're interested in facilitating discussions between the students who are remote and the students who are physically present in the classroom, uh, you know, creating that dialogue between the students who are remote and in the classroom uh, can be really difficult, right? Because you have the students who are remote, um, their voices are being channeled to everybody in the room. And so if you want to have, you know, groups of people or you know, if the student who is attending remotely is typically in a discussion group with, you know, three other students who are in the class, that kind of direct communication becomes almost impossible, you know, unless all of the students in the classroom also had computers and headphones where they could talk. And we'll talk about some yeah. solutions for that uh, in just a little bit. But yeah, so it's it's a it's a challenge to kind of create those group discussions. It's uh, pretty easy to let them. students remote participate in breakout rooms. Sure. Um, and it's pretty easy to let people in the classroom communicate. But if you have persistent teams where some students may be out on any given day, that's a challenge. And especially if you try doing something in a high flex modality, that becomes even more challenging because some of the students in those teams might not be there on particular days when they choose to use the asynchronous option. Um, um, in the chat, Sandy notes that there is a room with collaborative workspaces and each space has a computer screen. Um, wondering if they have mics. I don't, I suspect they don't. Um, most rooms like that were done to allow people to work with computer rooms in person. Um, the There's probably a microphone on the computers, but the problem is if they were all connected to everybody else, you'd end up with, with feedback loops. So 
The only way that could work is if everyone was wearing headphones within the groups or the groups had sound isolation. And I don't think that's true on any of the collaborative workspace rooms that we have. So this is a challenge and it, it limits some of the active learning activities you can do. Um, and it's one of the reasons why HyFlex has not been so widely adapted, um, adopted. So it's a bit of an issue. Um, and the other challenge is, again, as I already started to say, you never know who's going to be there. If you have a class of 30 students, some days you might have 30 in person and no one remote. Other days you may have 15 in each. Other days you might have zero in person and everyone's doing the asynchronous activity if that looks more appealing than what you had planned for the class. And so that makes it really difficult to, um, to have persistent groups because you can't guarantee that the people will always be there. And uh, yeah, and um, you know, when you're as the instructor and you're planning on certain types of group activities, um, you know, you may not be able to actually facilitate those in the right way because you don't know how many students you're going to have in, in different modalities. Um, and, you know, that it really does kind of put an extra, um, you know, extra labor on the instructor who's trying to manage, you know, the um, discussions that might be going on in a synchronous event you know, thinking about who's attending and uh, asynchronously and grading, you know, in uh, or assessing in, in that uh, modality, but also uh, monitoring what's going on in the classroom physically. So it's your, your attention as an instructor is pulled in a lot of different directions. It's hard to wander around the classroom and still see the chat, for example. Sure. Um, and also, very few of our classrooms, unlike many other campuses, have dual monitors. And again, that's something I've been arguing for since at least March of 2020. Actually, I've been arguing for about a decade. But since March of 2020, when people are using Zoom to bring in people remotely, a really challenging issue is if you start seeing private messages going in the chat to you, but you're sharing your screen with the whole class. And if you open up the chat and someone is saying, I'm feeling really ill, or I have this major problem, or I am having this health issue, or I just failed the last test, you probably don't want to open that on the screen that's being shared with a class in person. And, you know, one of the first things I did when I went remote was to, um, to get a second monitor. And now I have a second monitor in here that I bought a little portable one, and I brought that to class from time to time, simply because, or other things I've done is I brought in an iPad or another laptop just so I could monitor the chat on Zoom separate from the podium computer because of those issues. And that's really challenging. And Linda mentions, um, yeah, um, it seems problematic in trying to make sure everyone has the same work and giving the same efforts and students seeing it as a level playing field. Uh, some people are allowed to work remotely and others not, except in a truly high flex class, then anyone can choose whichever modality works best, um, which yeah. again, which it's, works best for them on that day. You know, the, the reason doesn't matter, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, if I just didn't wake up in time to attend in person, I could choose that week to attend asynchronously. Um, you know, of course, you know, there's, but that's the idea with high flex is that it doesn't, you students don't have to provide a particular reason to attend in a particular modality. They get to, you know, decide just based on their needs, their um, schedules, which works best for them. And there's a lot of advantages of high flex for students. It lets students deal with any issues. Um, um, swivel. Is swivel the little adapter for iPads that will rotate around? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done with that. And most of the research suggests it really doesn't provide much benefit. Essentially, what it does is it puts an iPad that connects to an individual student on a um, a remote control device that lets it rotate. So it's as if you have the person's head in the classroom speaking. Um, they're, they're, it's really good if you're a remote, uh, you noted that it's used in the School of Ed, and it is because it's a really good way in which instructors can monitor 
the students are supervising in the classroom and observe it. <clears throat> and it's a nice way of getting a good view without having to travel physically to all those classrooms. So for that sort of purpose, it's ideal. But it, it may be a little more challenging if you're trying to bring in, say, 10 or 12 or 20 students. First, you'd need those devices for all the remote students. Um, and secondly, you know, that there are issues with audio and so forth going back and forth and muting things. Now, there are platforms that'll do it, but they're tremendously expensive um, in ways that, you know, we probably couldn't afford to scale very easily. Um, and there is a bit of lag, as you noted. Um, so, um, and Linda also noted that, you know, the cognitive load can be difficult because of maintaining your peripheral vision, for example, that you have to be able to keep track of what's going in the classroom and what's going on remotely. And if you're sharing slides or sharing information on your main screen, you really need a second screen just to be able to jump in and involve with the remote students. And I think we only have a two or three classrooms that have that, maybe more. I think some of the classrooms in Shinneman have it. Uh, and I was able to get it about five years ago. I was able to get it in Lanigan 101, uh, and I was using it there. Although there is one of us, uh, someone who was teaching in a classroom behind me, uh, before me, who kept changing a setting so the two monitors duplicate each other. So I had to go into the system settings and reset that every damn class. But um, so it just added about three or four minutes to my setup time every day because someone wanted to use two monitors that were exactly the same right next to each other rather than using one for the things that were shared and one that was not. I don't know why anyone would do that, but it again, that added to the cognitive load. Uh, and also um, there's a suggestion, I think this is from uh, Sandy, about many people would like to teach at the Syracuse campus and beam it, beam it up to the main campus at the same time. And that's something that there was a lot of talk about for a while. There were those Cisco systems that were put in in various rooms. And that would be a nice option. But again, there's still some of the same issues of getting, you know, everyone mic. You need to have a microphone array in each location, and you'd have to have some way of getting cameras that would focus on the people or that were talking to main the same, maintain the same sense. And there are some really good systems that do that. I know FIT put them in all of their classrooms about four years ago, and it's it was a very expensive venture, and they were using WebEx. But basically, they have cameras that will automatically automatically sense where the voice is coming from. They aim to the person that's speaking, and then it's broadcast out and so forth. And it actually, the better systems don't really need that much tech training. Um, there was a suggestion we might need lots of tech training. Basically, there are devices such as the OWL, which is a camera and microphone system that goes in some conference room sort of like this, and it will automatically rotate the eyes of the arrow, that can the OWL, that has a camera in it, to aim at the people who are speaking, and it will pick up the audio in a fairly wide area and share that out. And that could work. But again, that technology is fairly expensive um, and some training would be needed. Um, and again, few classrooms have two monitors uh, and with a high flex modality, Again, you never know whether people will show up. If you have activities where you're planning small group activities with three or four students and you have two people show up in person, that's going to be hard to do. Or, you know, it's hard to plan things when you don't know whether if, if or when or if anyone will show up or how many students will show up. That's which why, Yeah, it's essentially teaching two courses at the same time because you can have Where you have an unknown number of students in each of them. So... It's a, it's a real challenge. And we do, we have one person on campus who was experimenting out with the SUNY, Ulysses was experimenting with that last semester uh, as part of a SUNY grant where he received some funding for that and some training. Um, and I haven't heard any reports on how it went for him yet, but throughout SUNY, there was funding for, I think it was about 30 people, maybe more, who experimented with high, high flex activities um, and so forth. Um, so those are the challenges. So we wanted to set up, you know, make it clear that this is none of this is easy, but there are some things you can do that work really well, no matter how you do that. Yeah. So um, polling is is one of the active learning activities that you can deploy in um, both students who are attending remotely and students who are physically present. So, um, you know, polling software that you might have. Um, 
you know, been aware of, like pull everywhere, you know, all of those things. That you actually Which cost thousands of dollars for a large class. Yeah, so maybe not for- But we should probably say we do have a site license for iClicker, which yeah. is something we did really well after the pandemic or after we move back to face-to-face -face teaching, but the college is funding that. And it's been doing that now for, I believe, three semesters, or maybe this will be the fourth yeah. semester coming up. And, and that app has really good capabilities. So students don't necessarily have to buy the physical remotes. Students you know? don't buy anything. They just use either. All they need is a web-enabled device. It could be a phone. It could be a, a laptop. It could be a Chromebook. Um, and Basically, they're able, you're able to do multiple choice responses, open-ended responses, um, and yeah, and um, heat maps where you have an, have an image and they can click on portions of the image to illustrate or to respond to your prompts. Um, and there's a lot you can do with that, numeric responses and so forth. Um, and there was a suggestion from Linda that um, you can use Panopto and have students logged into this. Um, to connect to that, and that works. Um, but the problem with Panopto for that purpose is it's really on the communication in both directions is not great. Um, I, I used to use this before we had, um, before I got a Zoom license, I use that in my large class and students could participate and communicate and their messages would pop up on the screen, but they popped up for about 10 seconds. And if you weren't looking at the screen when they popped up, you had to hope that some one of the students was looking at the screen and could repeat it. So it can work, it can work, but Zoom works a little bit better, um, but it does work. And in fact, there was a time, eight or nine years ago when we use Panopto with live streaming for all the workshops. So people remotely could listen. There's about a two, well, there's about a 60 second to a 90 second lag with Panopto, which was a bit of a challenge with clicker questions because I was using clicker questions then. And students would see on the screen that they had a minute and a half to respond. But by the time they saw that on the screen, the question had already been active for about 30 or 40 seconds. So when I had students participating remotely, I had to increase the time limit to give them more time to respond because of that time delay. But yeah, Panopto can do it and you can set it up to stream and that can work. Um, Again, yeah, the idea is you can you can engage students who are attending remotely and in the classroom with the same technology, and they're equally participating in that. And in terms of polling, I've had students who were in other countries because of issues with deaths in a family or weddings or other things participate in the poll in my large classes. They'd be watching the class on, you know, watching the questions pop up on their, their smartphone quite often or on a computer, and they'd be able to respond to the poll. And, and that worked well. I've had students who were going to sports, traveling for sports, who were on the bus. I've had students who were leaving early for various holidays participate while they were on a train or a bus. And so that is something that works both for the students in person and remote students. Um, so it, it is something that works very nicely and pretty much equally well whether students are in person or remote. The one thing that doesn't work as well is quite often when you do polling, you do it as a two-stage process, or really three stages, sort of like a think-pair-share, where you have students think about it, they vote themselves, and then you discuss it with other students. That's really easy to do if everyone is remote, you break them up into, into breakout rooms, or if they're all in person, but you can still do it where you have people in the classroom talk to each other, work through the problem together, and then vote again. And students remote can go into breakout rooms, discuss it, and bring it back. You can, you know, you could just have to be careful to give them enough time to discuss it remotely. It's pretty easy in the classroom to tell when students are ready to try a solution again. It's a bit harder when you have them in 50 or 60 breakout rooms, which was the case when. I had the large class and was teaching entirely remotely, but it can work. And? Um, you know, games like Kahoot um, or Jeopardy. So I don't know if many people have used Kahoot, but again, um, it's a app based, um, you know, or any web browser you can access, um, you know, it's a quiz, you know, sort of format. So you can have multiple choice, true and false, I think there's even ordering questions and, and so forth on there, but 
Um, and there's free response. I think there's numeric. Well, no, you can put in LaTeX questions if you're using okay. mass symbols and things. But yeah, so there's there's a lot of you know different um, um, you know types of questions you can add into that. But um, it's a game, so it, it does kind of add a little competition with students. So they do tend to enjoy um, competing with each other for points and and such. But you can access that, you know, whether you're remote or you're um, in person, as long as students, you know, have the ability to respond on their phones or. And um, part of the game aspect is who you get more points when you respond more quickly. Yes. And again, it's usually a no stakes activity. So there's no issue in terms of accessibility or, yeah. or others with it. Uh, students tend to enjoy it. Many of them used it in high school or elementary school. And it's a fun activity and it's a way of breaking up the activities you're doing. Um, and there's, I know people use Jeopardy. I'm, I've never tried that in class, but it's it's a similar type of thing. Um, and it is, it can be a fun experience. And even with a high flex modality, you can set it up so that you have students participate in the quiz in real time if they're participating either in person or remotely. And then for the students who are not there, you can share it as a do it yourself activity. You can put a link into it so students can try it at the same time. I'm sorry, on their own time and get some feedback on whether they answered correctly or not, whatever feedback you build into it. So that really does work in all three aspects of a high flex modality. Um, you know, exit ticket, muddiest point, one minute quiz activities. Um, you know, if you want to, if you engage in, in these um, activities in the classroom, uh, you can easily create a poll or a Google form to allow the students who are attending remotely to engage in that activity as well. Um, I've done muddiest points, um, you know, quite often in my class. And so, you know, to kind of allow students to you know, give that feedback um, to you. Um, you can, you know, certainly engage both your remote uh, participants and your in-class participants in, um, you know, perhaps different ways. But you can also, you know, um, with a QR code or, you know, a link um, that the students in the classroom, you know, they can all submit to a Google form, you know, whether they're remote or in-person. But, um, you know, there's, you know, you can um, kind of, however works best for you in that um, instance. And I've used that in the large class, both at the end of class, and I've also used it before the class. I've set it up in advance where after students have done some reading to prepare for a class, I'd ask them to respond, what was the most challenging part? What did they learn and what are, do they still find confusing from the reading? And then we focus more of the class time on working through problems on those activities. So there's a lot of ways you can do it. And Maggie mentioned a QR code. If you're really teaching students in both modalities, you can drop the URL in the chat and then you can put the QR code on a slide. And that way students in the classroom can just hold up the camera, you know, aim it and they get the um, they get the form or if they're remote, they can just click on the link and, and do it. And it's it's a good way of building in a little bit of metacognition. And there's some evidence that those things do improve the amount that students learn. There was a study done by an economist about a decade ago where he was teaching two sections of the course. I think it was about 40 or 50 students in each. And they were identical he did a lot of lecture, but it was essentially identical slides he used, the identical quizzes. The only difference is he did a one minute quiz at the end of class and the class where he did the one minute quiz, students scored dramatically, well, significantly better. I think like about 20% higher on the final exam in response to that. Um, his argument was that little bit of reflection led to some fairly significant improvements in what students recall. Because just reflecting on what did I learn yeah. today and well, what I don't I quite know, know yet that I need to review can have a significant difference. I do have to say studies on this have been mixed. STEM fields that's generally been found to be positive in some other disciplines, there wasn't a significant effect, but um, it can be useful and it's probably not a bad, I can't see it doing any harm in any case. Um, certainly think pair share activities you can do, again, for remote students, it would have to be done with breakout rooms of some sort. Oh, yeah, so virtual whiteboards, um, you know, again, dropping the URL in the chat or uh, QR codes. Um, so we actually have like- We've got one coming out just to see that, so. Yeah, and, um, so, you know, we, 
we've used Jamboards um, in Google, and I'm sure there's many there are other dozens options. and dozens. Many of them appeared during a pandemic, and we keep seeing new ones pop up every few days. Um, oh yeah, this this one's kind of nice too. You know, you can um, you know one of the I think really nice benefits of Google Docs and slides and sheets is that you can you know create a chat window for students to participate in. Um, of course, your in-person students would um, have to um, be able to access that either on their phones or, you know, in a uh, browser. Um, but you can see other people's um, interactions and engagements within those documents um, as they're working on it. And this is a good way of enabling small group activities when you don't know if students are going to be in person or remote because if they're working on a project and they may be putting slide presentations together, they may be working on a written document of some sort, it doesn't really matter that much whether they're in person or whether they're remote because they can all work in the document. And as Maggie said, they, they could open up the chat within the document and talk to each other right within it. There's other tools they could use. You know, they could chat using yeah, text yeah, messages or just Slack or other things, but doing it right in the document where everyone in the group can see it is a good way of getting past that communication barrier between the people in person and the people remote. I know when I've been writing proposals for or abstracts for sessions, a session proposals or paper proposals for conferences, I've often done that with my co-authors. Now, today I'm more likely to do it using Zoom, but if we go back five to 10 years, I often would do it right in Google Docs where we'd be texting each other as we were doing it. And it, we said, well, let me try rephrasing that. And one person writes, the other responds. Mm -hmm. And you know, you could each write different portions of the document and you can see what the other person is doing. And you, in real time, you can interact. And again, that could be done in Google Docs, Google Slides, mm -hmm. Google Sheets, yeah. or pretty much any any Google tool. So that's a really productive way of doing small groups when people may not always be in the same place. And outside the classroom, I do it in meetings all the time, you know, create a document so we can keep notes together and work on things together. And I know I'm not the only one who does that on campus, but, um, you know, I've, I've, I've done it working on research articles that co-authors are working through analyses and being able to kind of keep that communication and in such kind of time. So it was a very good tool in and out of the classroom. Using, well, I mentioned yeah. that already, yeah, using Slack, Slack or other group project tools. Um, Another thing that you could do, which is really kind of, it, it's a little isolating from other people in the room, but you could have everyone use Zoom on their own devices and then wear, his head, wear headphones or earbuds to hear everybody else. But again, that would really work if, you know. If, you know, the, if your students were far enough apart that they weren't picking each other up on each other's microphones, you know, with their, um, it, it, would, it would take a lot more logistics, I think, to make this. Yeah, that would be challenging. But back if we get back to the point where everyone has, you know, six feet of separation, sure. it's a possibility, but it wouldn't work in a crowded classroom very well. Yeah. Uh, fishbowl activities, you know, so having, you know, a group of students kind of discuss a particular topic and having everyone else kind of observe that topic and, um, you know, then kind of um, synthesize the discussion of you know what was going on for for that particular group that's another way that you can um you know incorporate those students remotely as well as people in the classroom i was teaching a this isn't quite a fishbowl but it's pretty similar i was teaching a capstone class last spring and every we only met once a week for three hours but every week there would be between one and three people out either with covid or or because of a car breakdown, or one person had a broken leg and couldn't easily get back and forth. And essentially what happened is when they were doing their presentations, some of the, they were typically in groups of three or four. Some of the students were in the room presenting from the front of the room. The other person was on Zoom and they were sharing the screen using Zoom. And then the remote person would just participate in the presentation. And it worked pretty smoothly. Um, again, it wouldn't be as good if they were working in smaller, well, if they were trying to do a lot of work 
synchronously. And again, this was a bichronous class. It wasn't a hyplex class because then you'd lose some people on the way, but, but it can work. And with a fishbowl, you basically have some people presenting and everyone else around them listening and then asking questions or something similar. There's a number of ways of doing it, but and certainly group, well, I've already yeah. described that group presentations. Um, and you could have small groups workshopping creative products, um, work that could be quickly evaluated. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, you can, you can certainly, it, it, it probably works best if you had enough people in the remote session that they could work in a group together in a breakout room. Um, but, you know, it's certainly, um, you know, possible if, you know, students are working on a project and they just want quick feedback and we can throw it up on the board, people remotely can chime in, people in the classroom can chime in, um, you know, definitely, um, you probably wouldn't want to have multiple conversations going on in the room at the same time, but it would be possible to work on. It, it can still be a challenge, yeah. yeah. Okay, so now what we're going to do is ask you for some suggestions. And I forgot to grab that URL. Let me, um, you can either hold your phone up to that image there, uh, or you can, well, let me grab this and let me see if I can grab it. Um, copy link address. And I will put that in the chat. I've gotten out of practice. Maggie's been doing most of this. Um, where did the chat go? Oh, there it is. I always lose the windows. There. Um, so this will take you right to a Google form, uh, to a Google Jamboard. Um, and there's a Jamboard. So that's that whiteboard that we were talking about. So you can you can draw on it. You can add, I, I think, you know, most people like to add little sticky notes. So there's, on the left side, you can see the um, sticky note icon underneath the cursor there. You can add a, some ideas. And this is, again, one of the nice things about it is it's anonymous. It's a really good way of getting feedback on how your class is going, what's working for students. Um, oh, if you're using a mobile device, you do have to download the app. But if you're on a laptop, then you should be able to do it directly. Um, I, I didn't realize that. So the code, again, is, um, let me go back to the slides. Um, oh, I, I guess I... Here we go. Um, nope, there we go. There we go. Uh, but yeah, the first time you do this on a mobile device, you have to download an app. Um, but if students are remotely working remotely and it's on their computer, it will just open directly up. And this is a really good way of asking students for anonymous feedback. We're asking what's working for you in the class? What's, it's not working? It worked for me because I clicked on it and that popped up, but. <laughs> well, I'm not sure. I didn't try the QR code. I don't know if I really have anything to add to the jam board. Because I haven't really, like, um, I don't, I don't know that I've done anything that's really been what I would deem as successful. It was more like, you know, let's get through this. You know, it was during the the pandemic yeah. and the first time you've we had a lot of that. <laughs> went yeah. back to in person, so it was like it was just like sink or swim, try and make this work so the student can, you know, be involved and and get the material. And yeah, so I don't know, but I, I, I yeah, I don't know. Oh, I, haven't, oh. I haven't really had an official um, Bichronus or Hyflex class yet, but it's a possibility I may have one in the fall, so. I, I haven't taught any of that either, but it makes me sort of chuckle because I think in like 1995 or something way back then, I used to do trainings for the CDC and I was up in rural Maine and I did a training to a group of people around a conference table, but then we satellited it. I don't know how they did it, but it was like on TV screens to three rural community groups. 
we oh. offered three or four classes that way here too. It was broadcast on local TV. Really? Yeah. yeah. But it was live. Um, it was synchronous and yes. I could hear them and they could hear me. So that was whatever old school. It worked really well. It was before we joined the SUNY Learning Network, or maybe even before the SUNY Learning Network was created. Yeah. Um, Dave Bozek taught a class in psychology, and Glenn Graham in my department taught an economics class. And I think there were a couple other people who did it. Um, oh, that's cool. Um, I'll say that. So I'm still, I still have a question. Um, sure. And this is just because I don't, you know, technolo technically this blows me away of how it all works. But um, why couldn't everybody, like I always, this is the only time I'm not, I usually I wear a headset always just because there's too much noise, noise in my background and it's, it's wired and I plug it into my computer. Um, I mean, if everybody did something like that, they could all zoom, right? And then there mm -hmm. wouldn't be all that feedback. I mean, my headset is $6.99. It's so cheap. Um, yes. Well, actually, you know, I was able to buy some bulk ones online for about yeah. 70 cents each when you buy them in groups of yeah. like 25. So I, I did buy them for some students to use in a class in Duke when we were oh, going nice. to do that last summer. So, But that would work, yeah. right? If they all just yeah. did Zoom and then you could, they could all be in breakout groups, like the people in person could then be Communicate with, with, the with, the, with, the, right. with the, you know, online people, right? Especially if you can spread the groups out far enough so that you'd mostly hear the people in your own group rather than people in other groups talking with them. Well, but if you have the headset like I usually wear with a little microphone, and stuff, I just I talk at a very low level. You know, I yeah. Don't as long as everyone's head. talking in a low voice yeah, and yeah. they're, I mean, if someone's right next to you, they'll still be picked up they'll on those headsets. Okay. Okay. But, mm. Mm. I was going to say that I don't I I don't really officially like you know it's not in my syllabus that I offer the remote option though I do think I, I should be doing that because I think I can manage um you know having students attend remotely I know you've done it for a long time um but whenever I have had I, I have had students request that they attend remotely and I always you know work to accommodate that but because it's not an everyday thing for me, I usually designate a student to be like monitoring the chat, to be like, hey, keep an eye on the chat here. I usually pick someone who's not always very focused in class generally, so that keeps their focus on, um, you know, the, <laughs> the material that we're working on. And it's, it, so, you know, even things like that have helped make a Bicronus environment work. Um, especially, you know, for, you know, someone who, like myself, who may not be doing it on a super regular basis, but, you know, it happens that the student um, doesn't have a way to get to campus, and, you know, this is the way that they, you know, are able to attend, and, um, and it's not, you know, penalizing them for missing class, because they're not, they're, they're there, and they're participating. Um, but I do like to designate students to keep me on track of making yeah. sure that, and they, they they take the role pretty seriously. Derek Brush like, suggested that in a blog post in the early stages of the pandemic. Just put one person in charge yeah. of monitoring the chat and relaying it to you. So that way it reduces your cognitive yeah. work quite a bit. And it does keep that student focused. It does. One thing I've, that I have used in class, even even though it was like everybody being present, I think, and there may have been an incident where someone wasn't, but is using a Google Doc when I want them to come up with some ideas or something like that. And I'll have it all in one page. Mm -hmm. um, this is particularly for English 102 classes and freshmen are kind of, you know, timid or whatever, but Sometimes with me having that all in one page and I'll even have it on this big screen in class so everybody can see that everybody's typing and busy so that it kind of motivates that student that doesn't want to do anything that like but everybody else's pretty colors are moving in my art. <laughs> That's a good so idea. Find, yeah, so I find it kind of motivates them. It puts some excitement in them or whatever to um, participate in that way. I know um, I don't teach, I haven't taught, to be honest. I mean, I'm doing mostly online. So, um, but I, you just got me thinking about the Google Docs. I know my husband's a professor too, and he does, he's always done shared note-taking on a public Google Docs. And so Linda, that's sort of a similar thing. And they take turns, but then people can jump in and, you know, change the notes or 
fix something or, and it gets very collaborative. He says it's worked really well. And that way he does assign like two or three people to do it. So, and they rotate all the time so they can focus. Um, but then other people can chime in and, and fix that. So I, I like that idea. And Linda mentioned and comment too, but you can do that. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I have a hard time just even doing this Zoom thing right now and watching the chat. Like I just, you talk about cognitive overload. <laughs> uh, so I like yeah, the idea of having, me, the, having the students assist us is, is good. Yeah. What really got to me was when I tried doing it on one screen for the first time in a couple of years when I moved back into our Mahar classrooms, mm -hmm. it was it was tough because I'd see these messages come in for students. And I was also recording the class in case someone couldn't participate either way. So even if I were to blank the screen, it would still be on the recording. And a couple of times I did that so it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be um, streamed, viewed by the students in class or other remote students when it was a personal message. But then I had to edit it out of the recording, right. you know, when students were revealing something personal that they probably didn't want to share with the entire yeah. class. And it's- and students, they, they will share personal things. They'll direct message you and be like, I'm so sorry, here's my health issue. And I'm like, oh gosh, I didn't need to know that, but okay, you know, but right. It does then kind of, yeah. you know, you have to be extra careful about how that's getting broadcasted to the rest of the class. And yeah, it could be something like, you know, I'm not feeling that well and I have to go and vomit right yeah. now and yeah. I'll be back in a couple minutes or something or yeah. or my dog just, you know, yeah. made a mess on the floor or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that makes me nervous with, with that, especially um, because like sometimes I don't know, I, I tend to hack my way through things. So I don't necessarily know what the right button is, but like I intuitively find it. But if I'm having to think about too many things at once, I'm more than likely to make a mistake and then divulge somebody's like, you know, serious issue. And yeah, that would be bad. So. I usually I, do, you know, tell students like, you know, the chat, like, especially if I'm working on one screen, which I am in Mahar, you know, and again, I, I don't do this on a regular, you know, super regular basis, but I will tell them like, hey, your chat is going to be shown to everybody in the class, you know, right at the beginning, just so that they know, you know, what to, what to put in there and, you know, what to not. <laughs> Yeah. And again, I've often used either brought my own laptop in addition to the podium system and logged in that way. And then, but that's a little more challenging. It's a little more challenging with our two factor authentication because, you know, as long as I start it and authenticate with one and I don't set it up to require authentication, I can do that by coming in with a different name without being logged in. But it's, it's a little more challenging. Yeah, it just adds to the cognitive load, the time, you know, that it takes to set all of that up. But yeah, so challenges, but there are some good ways to work around if you can. So, so I have a question, John and Maggie. It sounds like, you know, you do this a little bit. And John, especially in your large class, it sounds like you have to, I mean, I think it's nice that we offer this alternative method for students who can't attend in person, but obviously they've signed up for an in-person class. Um, are there any ways to incentivize them to attend in person? Because I'm afraid people will take advantage of this. And I guess as an online instructor, I see this a lot of people shopping, you know, and even as an advisor, often they'll say, hey, I'm gonna try to take all my classes online next semester, so I don't have to come back to campus or pay my rent. You know, can I do that? And I said, well, yeah, you can officially, we're not going to let you switch over to our online major because you're at a certain level in your program, but yeah. it's you, an issue. It, it's an issue, you know. I've actually had it go more the other reason that I've had more students who chose to, many of the students who attend online is because they're sick or this past fall, there were a lot of students out with the flu. There were lots right. of, you know, there was a number of things going around. And most of the time it was, out of 320 students, most of the time it was about eight to 15 students. 
you know, which isn't that huge of a proportion, except that was every day. So there were always some students who were missing. And, you know, with the life polling, which was graded, really low stakes grades and so forth, um, but it was still a graded activity. I didn't want them to be excluded. But what I started to say is that it wasn't so much that students sometimes did it to make it easier for themselves. Sometimes they did it because they just felt really anxious in a big crowded classroom or, you know, in a big classroom, especially in the back, especially this semester, because I had a broken leg and I couldn't walk around for much of the semester. I couldn't climb the stairs until probably about a month ago, um, you know, because it is tiered in Lanigan 101. There's always a little bit of a buzz of people talking to each other in the back of the room. And some students said they were really annoyed by the background noise of people around them talking. And so they preferred participating remotely because it was only me that was being mic'd and they could still hear what I said. They could see the questions they were asked. They could work on them. They could work with other people in breakout rooms. So some of them were really good students who just didn't feel comfortable in that large class setting and found it to be better. Now, I would say there were probably only about three or four students who did that, and they did it pretty regularly after the first few weeks. But, you know, it didn't bother me that much they were doing it because they were still participating. They were asking questions either in the chat or by the microphone. And, you know, they were still doing everything in the class, and some of them did it really productively. So, you know, if you're still doing activities where they're doing the same activities in person or remotely, you know, if they decide that it's snowing too badly for them to safely drive someday, that didn't happen this fall, but I mean, that wouldn't trouble me that much, you know, um, but it is a bit more work. Um, but again, I wasn't teaching a high flex class. It was, you know, basically an in-person class with some percentage of the students attending remotely. Um, I, I prefer not to do that. It was certainly easier not to do that, but I don't know. You know, there's so many students who have car breakdowns and it's going to take them two or three weeks to get it fixed. Uh, there were students who were waiting for chips for their car this past spring and fall because they there was a shortage of them. And, you know, I know people who waited for months to get parts for their car so their cars could run again. Um, sometimes they had loaners, sometimes they didn't. And um, were students who just had communicate or, or they were driving with someone and that person was no longer dropped out of school or something or their schedule changed and they could no longer commute that easily. So there's lots of reasons why our students can't be here. And some of them may be that it's just easier not to be. Right. Um, and yeah, there is an element of kind of letting go of, you know, some of that, but I think, you know, part of the, um, you know, the, the goal here is incorporating activities that keep both groups of students engaged. And so if, if you're able to do that and you're able to plan and structure your class so that, you know, both modalities can be successful and active in the class, then I think you kind of alleviate some of the concerns about why students are choosing one modality over the other. And I'm sure there are some students who just do it to give the appearance of being there sure. while they've got the camera off and while they're doing something else. You know, we certainly saw a lot of that during remote instruction, but but I don't think that was the, the majority of the students who were attending remotely. Most of them told me in advance why they couldn't be there and or they'd write to me saying, I can't be there. Is it OK if I come in on Zoom? And my response was always, sure, the URL is posted in, in Brightspace. So. I don't know. Any other questions or thoughts? Nope. Okay. Well, we are past our time, actually. Yeah. So, well, thank you. Good seeing you. And thank you for we'll the information. You. I took a lot of notes. So, <laughs> I hope it was useful. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Yep. You too. You too. And stop the recording.